Well, Peter looked at him and said, Lord, bid me come to thee. He fixed his eyes upon the Lord, trusted in his holy word by faith. He walked upon the water of the dark Galilee by faith. He walked upon the water at the Lord's command. He knew that nothing would matter if his faith would stand. Now if you're sinking in despair, there's no comfort anywhere by faith. Step out upon the water for Jesus is there. When Jesus said, come unto me, he quickly started out. But when he looked upon the waves, he soon began to doubt. And as he sank down in the sea, he cried and said, O Lord, send me by faith. He walked upon the water of the dark Galilee. By faith, he walked upon the water at the Lord's command. He knew that nothing would matter if his faith would stand. So if you're sinking in despair, there's no comfort anywhere by faith. Step out upon the water, for Jesus is there. By faith, he walked upon the water at the Lord's command. He knew nothing would matter if his faith would stand. So if you're sinking in despair, there's no comfort anywhere by faith. Step out upon the water, for Jesus is there. you keep coming here at the Glory Bound Baptist Church. If you're tuning in on us today, this is the Glory Bound Baptist Church, Stephenville, Texas. So we're glad you're here because we talk about real issues of, of, of life and about Christianity. And the greatest thing in this world is to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Amen. The greatest Amen. thing, the greatest blessing that you'll ever have. And another great blessing is being at a church that cares and a church that does things right, you know, and... Uh, we just hope if you're nearby and you're not attending a church like ours, that you come give us a visit. And we think you'll like it. We have d different services and different things going on. And God bless you today. We pray you listen to the sermon. We're currently now continuing on in the life of Christ. 243 different incidents and happenings that happened to Jesus when he was on this earth. And remember I told you back in the beginning at Christmas time, we can't talk about all of them. We're just going to hit the major ones today. And so today we want to ask you to go with us to John chapter 8. And if you look at your bulletin, notice the text of the sermon, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Man, what words from the Savior. Today we're going to be talking about a sad situation. And you know what, it's good to talk about happy things. I, I like that, blessings. You know, Jesus walking on the water and lifting Peter out of the water and blessing him and blessing the apostles. The disciples, remember when he told them to throw the net on the other side and they pulled in all the fish. Those are good times, amen? amen? And God is the God of the good times, but he's the good of the bad times too. Today we're going to be talking about a, a difficult story to talk about, but it's important because Jesus dealt with the issues of the day. Like we need to deal with the issues of today as a church and as individuals, as families. And so, I want you to remember that we're studying out of God's Word, and for those that are watching us on the Internet, the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is our authority. All right? Now, I'm not maybe going to read out of this, but I've got it printed in my notes, so it'll be coming straight out of the Bible. And we want to invite you, if you have a Bible, to turn with us to John chapter 8. And we're going to be talking about heavy-duty life. Because life gets heavy at times, doesn't it? Doesn't it get hard and difficult at times? And you know what? It's hard when you're born. Now, we don't remember the, the event of being born, but I'm sure we struggled when we were born. I'm sure as we were growing up, we would fall down, guys, and get hurt a little bit and get up, dust, dust, knock the dust off, and go on, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, things in life, maybe your first job wasn't the best thing, the, the best job you ever had, or maybe you didn't perform it as well as you could have or should have, and you suffered because of it. I don't know. And I know the men that are here that were in the military, you'll never forget the military. Amen. When you tell the truth, Amen. how hard it was. And if, you're, if you've been in the military, you know what I'm talking about. Today I want to ask you the question. Have you ever done anything bad in your life? Amen. I mean big and bad. I mean huge. Have you ever done something that 
you necessarily don't want people to know about. Have you ever sinned? I know that we all have, and there's things in our past that we wish we could have a chance to do over. Am I telling the truth on that? Amen. We had that opportunity. All right? Today we want to talk about a woman that was all messed up in problems and what she went through and what Jesus did for her. And let me just say this. Jesus is the game changer for all of us. He's it. He's our Savior. He came in this world to meet us where we are and to help us. And that's what he did with this lady. So today, we want to, first of all, talk about what did this woman do? <clears throat> Let's start out by reading verse 1, John chapter 8, if you have your Bibles. And Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. All right, now this is all good. We like that. That's positive. And up to this point, Jesus has been winning people to himself, They've, been, they, they've gotten baptized. They became his disciples. <clears throat> we talked about in Sunday school how that he had fed thousands at one setting. He did that a couple of times. And he was, he was healing people. He was casting demons out of people. Remember last week we talked about demon possession. And I believe it's real. I really do. And I believe that the peop some people that we see are demon possessed. And maybe if not demon possessed, demon influenced Remember the demons are Satan's angels that are working to cause people to encourage people to sin. And so he's teaching in the temple, and all this is good. And notice now verse 3, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now notice in verse 3, it was the scribes and Pharisees. What are scribes? Scribes were consecrated priests, and their job was to, was to copy Scripture. They didn't have IBM copy machines. Or they didn't have these printers, these, these laser printers that we have today. We have this all-in-one unit at our house, and we print all of our tracts and flyers. We do our sermons, we do letters, we do all kinds of stuff on that printer. And if you have a printer at home, I'm sure you use it from time to time. Ours, ours, is, ours gets a workout. It really does. Right, Jay? It does. And so today, these scribes, we want you to know that they were the ones that wrote Scripture. They had to wash their hands before they worked. And they, they were very scrupulous in how they wrote the Word of God so that it was copied correctly and done in a way that was a sanctified way or holy. In other words, they gave reverence to God's Word. They knew the law. They had written it. They didn't just read it, they had written it. And so they were familiar with it. And the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. Okay? So they bring this woman before Jesus and throw her at him and put her in the middle of all this group of men. And they say, here's a woman that is caught in the very act of committing adultery. Notice now verse 5. <clears throat> and they're telling Jesus, now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? So they've heard Jesus teach now. They've heard him preach. They know that he's claimed to be the Son of God. And of course, who could quote Scripture better than Jesus? Nobody. And they knew that he was a holy man, but they wanted to test him. But they didn't, they didn't trust him, and they didn't like him, and they didn't believe in him. So they were tempting Jesus, the Bible says. Now when you get into Leviticus chapter 20, you don't need to turn there, but it says that if one man committeth adultery with another man's wife, and he, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. The penalty for adultery was being stoned to death. That was it. That was Old Testament law. And they were testing Jesus to see what Jesus was going to do with this situation. Okay? And this, verse 6, they said, tempting him that they might have something to accuse him with, but Jesus did something. What did he do? He stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Evidently they're outside and I'm supposing they're all like on an area of dirt. And he could actually stoop down. Have you ever done that as a child? Reach down and, you know, write something like, like Jeff loves Amanda with an arrow, something like that. You know, kids do those kinds of things. And Jesus wrote on the ground. But we have a little bit of a problem in Scripture. What do you think that is? We don't know what Jesus wrote. It wasn't recorded. 
and Bible scholars and people who write commentaries on the Bible have, have long opined about what Jesus wrote. I'm going to tell you what I think in a minute. But anyway, he wrote down on the ground as though they heard him not. Verse 7, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. All right. So what he's writing on the ground is very important. Some think that he wrote this passage in <clears throat> Leviticus that I just quoted to you about, He that commits adultery shall be put to death. Some have said that. What I think he wrote... He wrote down the names of all the men that were there, beginning the oldest to the youngest. Joe, Sam, Bill, George, not this Bill, Bill, George, Henry. And he's writing the names, of, that's what I think he's doing. And he's writing it big enough so they can see their names written on the ground. And why is he doing that? I think because these men had known this woman in an intimate way prior to this incident. That's what I think. She's a lady of the town, and I'm thinking that those gentlemen had met her at other times before this, and he's writing down their names. That's what I think he wrote. They knew the law. Okay? So what happened? And so Jesus said, He that is without the sin among you, cast the first stone, verse 7. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. That's what I think he wrote was the names of these men. Because he knew them. He, he knew every. Jesus is omniscient. You know what that means? He knows everything. He knows us. Intimately he knows us. He knows the goings of our hearts. He knows if we're saved. He knows the thoughts and intents of our heart. He knows what you're thinking right now. Did you know that? He knows what you're thinking on the internet. He knows every thought you're thinking right now. He knows us intimately. He knows us. And when Jesus said that, look at verse 9, the result of, of Jesus teaching these people. This is a teaching moment for them. A teaching. What did Jesus say? Let him that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at the, any of you who are innocent. He's presuming that they're He's, he's intimating they're guilty in, in a way. He's trying them to see if they're going to admit their failure as, as being sinners being disobedient. And again, I believe it's because they had known this woman before intimately. And notice verse 9, what happened? And, which, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Now let me say this. When God deals with you and deals with me, we're going to be convicted in our, in, our, in our soul, in our spirit. We're going to be... Do you know what conviction is? Conviction is... It comes into us, and it is like God explaining to us our failures before Him. Do you ever feel like that sometimes? Do you ever feel spiritually inadequate before the Lord? You know what? I feel like that every day. I feel like I'm imperfect. I have faults and failures in my life. And I just, you know, I'm not as perfect as I would like to be. Anybody ever feel like that? You don't feel like you measure up? Well, you know what? That's, that's a common human feeling, I believe. It's because the Holy Spirit is dealing with us. Dealing with us. And these men were convicted. But I believe it's because Jesus wrote their names down in the dirt that they saw it. And they were convicted. The elder, from the eldest all the way down to the youngest. And what did they do? They got up and left. And here's the woman standing there alone with Jesus. Now notice Jesus dealt with these men, and now he's going to deal with her. Very interesting story. So he dealt with the men. They all left. And I imagine they left shaking their heads, thinking, how did he know? How did he know? I thought what was done in secret, nobody knew about. God knows. God knows the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. He knows what we do. He knows how we think. He knows how we live when no one's looking. Amen? All right, in verse 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? 
Hath no man condemned thee? That's an honest question. He's just wanting to know, where are they? And notice what she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn thee. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Wow. Guess what happened? She met the Lord face to face and became a believer right then. No man, Lord. She realized who he was. She realized that she had been caught in her sin too. And she realized she was guilty before Jesus. Notice now, Jesus is the only one in the universe that had the authority and the right to judge those men and to judge her by killing those that were guilty. He had the right to do that. He's the creator of this world. He's the judge. And he will judge all of humanity, when all of lost humanity, one day at the great, great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. And so she says, No man, Lord. And the Lord said, Jesus said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and send them more. Now what's the teaching for us today? First of all, we have to talk about the men. These men were selfish and hateful. And you know what? The Bible teaches us that we can sin in our hearts and it's the same as if we commit the sin actually doing it. The sin of our heart. Did you know that? We can sin in our hearts. Whatever sin. Because when we sin, when we do something bad, remember I asked you at the beginning of the sermon, have you ever done anything wrong? If you ever do anything wrong, you know where, you, where, it ha where it's, it's birth? It's in your, it's in your brain and in your heart. You, you, you're tempted to do something and you say, I'm going to do it. All right? You're tempted to sin, and then you commit the, commit the act, whatever. But these men were hell-bent on getting this woman killed. Is that pretty much how it looks to you? you would you agree with me on that? Mm -hmm. they, they want her dead. Now, isn't that a little strange? I mean, would you want to kill somebody? These men wanted her dead. Okay? Now, how can we explain that? I've got several things I want to share with you today. We want to, I want to go over this with you. Because first of all, we're dealing with the men in our story here today. Number one, maybe they wanted to tempt Jesus. I think that's what the, 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 the text here says. And, if, and to see if he would permit them to stone her to death. All right? And they said this in verse 6. This they said, tempting him that they might accuse him. All right? What's the problem? If Jesus had let her go, he could be accused of the Jews for not obeying the law of Moses. Right? Because the law said that the adulteress and the adulterer had to be stoned to death. Pretty rough time, wasn't it? And then if he, if he, if, if he let her go, he would be guilty of not obeying the law. And then if he said, go ahead and stone her, the Roman government would accuse him of sedition and of his, his approving the killing of her would ruin his testimony of being a friend of publicans and sinners. He, he had this testimony. He was a friend of publicans and sinners. What is a publican? Publicans are tax collectors in the Bible. And the publicans were hated. Do you like the IRS guy that comes around? Anybody ever been audited by somebody from the IRS? Burl, did you like that time? When you, no, you didn't like it. Did he come to your house? No, we went to the office. Yeah. Gives you, In Fort Worth. It upsets your stomach, and right? And you're thinking, am I getting this going to work? I don't want to get audited. Good enough. Hey, I got some good news for you. Our church, ha, we have this new corporation soul. We'll never be audited. We'll never be brought legally of any, in any way before the government because we're exempt. We are totally separate from the government. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. We got to thank Amen. God every day for that when you're praying for Brother Amen. Ron and praying for our church. Thank the Lord for this corporation that we have. So anyway, Jesus couldn't win if he said kill her or not kill her. Jesus could not win because nobody was going to agree with that. All right, so they they wanted to tempt him. They wanted him to say it was okay to kill her or not to kill her, but they wanted her dead. Now the third reason here, maybe there was something else in play that we don't know about and the Bible doesn't say, but maybe maybe she was expecting a child. And someone in that group wanted this woman killed to cover up the sin. Is that a possibility, do you think? Amen. It's a possibility. Why? Because when people sin, they want to cover their sin. You don't want to sin in the daylight. You want to sin in the darkness, right? You don't want to do things that's open. You don't want people to see. 
And when people commit adultery and there's a child that's conceived, what do they do today? What's the common practice in the world today? Abortion. Abortion. All right. Let me go on record as saying abortion is murder. Because that little baby, when it's conceived, is a human being. Amen. And uh, you know what? I understand why women say that it's their body and they have a right to get rid of that child. But I want you to know on the internet and the folks here, abortion is murder. Same as killing. And these late-term abortions, it's just nothing more than murder. When that child comes out of the womb and it's alive, in China they kill them. We were talking in Sunday school. A report came to me yesterday that uh, the dictator in Cuba, the son of the fellow that died, killed 33 Christian teenagers for a faith in Christ. Murdered them. Had them shot to death. And so I'm thinking to myself, what's this world coming to? Why kill? And when you kill it, you know what? Killing a, a, a baby in the womb, killing an infant that's just born, or killing a teenager, what's the difference? It's all the same. Murder is murder is murder. Amen? Murder is yeah. wrong. Maybe they wanted to cover up this woman's pregnancy. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But I do know this, that they wanted her to be stoned to death. They came and they insisted that Jesus give an answer. And Jesus wouldn't do it. But here's another question. This is, a, this is like a neon sign to me in this whole story. The Bible says that the woman and the man should be put to death. Where's the man? If she was caught in the very act, where's the man that was with her? Nothing is said. Doesn't that seem a little inconsistent to you? It's like a big flag to me. Inconsistent. Wrong. He should have been there with her. But she, she was in no bargaining position in the position that she was in. She had been brought there accused of, of this crime. So anyway, that, that's not good. But Jesus exposed these men and said, He that is without sin, cast the first stone. If you're so high and mighty righteous, get the stone and help yourself. And they all walked out. Why? Because Jesus had indicated to them that He knew their names and that they had been with that woman before and they were guilty. That's what I think happened. Pretty interesting. He exposed them spiritually for what they were. And they got the message. They got the message and left. You know what, that, you know what let me just say this. Sometimes we deal with people on a, on a spiritual level about the sins in their life. And they hear, but they don't accept what you say to them for counsel. You know what they do? They walk out the door and never come back. It's too much for them. They don't like how we cut it off the cob. It's too painful, or too embarrassing, or too hurtful. I don't know. But you know what the, you know what you should do? Is if you do something wrong, you should fess up to it, admit it, confess it, forsake it. That's the Bible way. Amen? It really Amen. is. Alright. Now, what else did Jesus do? He not only dealt with these men, but he dealt with the woman in her in her sinful condition. Alright? Her accusers were gone. But Jesus knew what she had done. He knew that. And she was guilty with nothing to say. She couldn't say anything. She was guilty. She was caught in the act. Okay? And she, you know what Jesus did? He could have come down on her just like that. That's what the world does. When it has an opportunity to judge. Just like that. That, that makes the old flesh feel good when you have the power to give it to somebody that deserves it. Jesus didn't do that. Why? Because He loves us. He's merciful. He cares for us. And what did He do? He says, woman, where are thy accusers? And she says, they're gone. And He says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's grace. That's getting a blessing that we don't deserve, that she didn't deserve. That's what God does to us when they get saved. Do you realize that? We deserve judgment. We deserve to die and go to hell. We deserve to be judged by God. But when you turn over to Christ and receive Him as your Savior and trust Him, wow, the grace of God. We sang it today. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. What, what great words those are. A wretch like me. Spiritually, we're wretches. That's what we are spiritually. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that our righteousness is like filthy rags. 
In other words, our goodness is like, how would you like to have a, a deep wound or a cut and, and somebody to take an old greasy rag they used to clean the tractor with and say, here, I want to bandage up your, your wound. Would you let them do that? I wouldn't. I mean, maybe if I were bleeding to death and they could use it to, you know, stop the bleeding, maybe. But just to bind the wound, I'd say, no, no, no. But God says our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. That's what we are. We're nothing. We're wretched. We're, 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 we're terrible. And then the Lord saves us, gives us a new name written down in glory. Our sins are forgiven. Isn't that wonderful? She experienced the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ when he dealt with her that day. And, and how long did it take that fast? Salvation is instantaneous. Trust the Lord you save. And, 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 he, and he comes in. And you know what? I know this woman got saved and got born again. We'll see her in heaven. Now, why is this incident, thirdly, important for us today? Why is it so important? All right? First, because judging someone is not our job. We're not the judge. You know why it's, it's wrong? And you know why, why it's wrong? First of all, because it's presumptuous. It's God's job to judge, not us. We're not judges. Okay? And uh, the Bible says in Psalm 9, 8, And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in unrighteousness. In other words, it's God's place to judge. And we know if we've read the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible, that all of the, un the people that are not saved are going to be resurrected and will stand before Jesus Christ in the, at the great white throne. And the books will be opened, the book of life, and they'll be looking for their names in that book. And if they're not found, they're going to be sent to hell forever and forever and forever. The word of the Lord, Re Revelation chapter 20. Jesus is going to judge this world. He's going to judge it. He's going to send them to hell, those that didn't get saved, you see. So it's not our place to judge others. And then Jesus said to those who were following him in the Sermon on the Mount, Judge not, lest ye be judged. Matthew 7, 1. You know what? We're not the judges. We're not supposed to. It's not our place. It's God's place to judge. So, don't judge people. What's that saying that they said about an Indian? Don't, don't, complain, don't complain about someone unless you walked a mile in his, in his moccasins. You ever heard that saying before? Jeff, you ever heard that before? I've heard it. Yeah. Don't judge somebody unless you walked a mile in their moccasins. In other words, you feel what they feel. Amen? All right? Now, the second thing, not only should we not judge, but secondly, considering this woman, Jesus dealt with her spiritually. There were no games. There was no jiving. There was no mumbo-jumbo. He didn't say, do this for me and I'll do this for you. He didn't make it. He didn't make a deal with her. He just said, where's your accuser? She's not. Neither do I condemn you. Go and send no more. Okay? That's how he deals with us. That's how we should be towards other people. We should be forgiving and kind. Now, it's hard to be like Christ. You remember that saying, what would Jesus do? How many have ever heard of that song? What would Jesus do? That's a great saying. I like that. What would he do? That's how we should react. All right? So did Jesus deal with everybody appropriately in our story. What do you think? Yes? He, did. he sure did. He gave those scribes and Pharisees what for? They should know better. They should have just said, Lord, we follow you. We submit to you. We believe in you. They didn't say that. They just walked out mad. Later, they were going to crucify Jesus, put him on the cross. The woman was happy. I mean, she, was, she thought she was going to be dead before the day was over. And she, not only did she survive, but she was saved. She trusted the Lord as her personal Savior. That's great. So today, thinking about this story and about how the, all that's happened today in our lesson, I want to ask you this question in closing. How are you spiritually before the Lord today? Are you walking with the Lord or are you far off? Because you know what? We're either walking with the Lord or we're walking away from the Lord. Did you know that? You can't, have, you can't sit on the fence. You just can't do it. It's impossible to sit on the fence with Jesus. You're either following Him or you're not. Okay? So where are you today? Are you saved? I hope so. Do you know him as your person? If not, today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Today is accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Are you living for the Lord? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? You know what? Um, I would encourage you, you know, to become a member of our church. You know, if you're not a member. You say, well, I'm not sure yet. Well, think about it. You know, if God's leading you, come on, be a part of us. Amen? And uh, if you've got issues in your life that need to be, uh, to be dealt with, I'm here. I'll visit with you. I'll be happy to talk to you. Okay? 
And we'll open the Bible and see what the Bible says about problems, whatever. I just ask you this question, how are you with the Lord today? And I know that sometimes people get crossways, crosswise, crosswise, crossways with the Lord, and you're out of kilter. You know what, when you go to a chiropractor, how many's ever been to a chiropractor? Okay? And they always crack your neck, and they do this, and they do that, and, you, and I'm always praying, Lord, I hope it doesn't twist my head off. Because they go, and I'm going, how did he know how to do that? A chiropractor told me, they can't graduate unless they know how to do that. So if they've got a piece of paper on the wall, I figure they know how to do that. But what they're doing is, your back's out of line, and they want to get it in line, because if your back's in line, you can do things like this. You can walk, and you can run, and you can do whatever you need to do. But if you're kind of like this, and you can't do anything, you think, oh man, my back's crooked. Sometimes we get up at, at, in the morning and we feel like that. No, oh, my back is killing me. Oh my goodness. You know, we get that way spiritually. Our, ba our spiritual back is out of whack. We need to get straight. Let the Holy Spirit work on us and manu uh, manipulate our back spiritually so that we get right with Him. So I just ask you the question, how are you with the Lord today? Are you walking with Him? Or are you far off? Today is a day of salvation. Today is a day to get right with the Lord. And I like to say this, if you have spiritual business to do with the Lord, let me encourage you to do that today. Heads are bowed and eyes closed as Peggy comes to the piano. I'm so glad that that woman found salvation in Jesus. I'm glad. I'm really happy. Because when you meet Jesus and, and He deals with you spiritually, it's always better. Amen? It's always better. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, how many can say, Brother Ron, I know today, I know in my heart, if I die today, I know that I'd go to heaven, and I'm lifting my hand to let you know that. If you could say that, would you lift your hand, please, as a testimony that God bless you? And put your hands down. All right, thank you for that. How many can say, Brother Ron, God is dealing with me in my life about a spiritual issue. I, I may not know what that is, but you know if you are, and you know if he's dealing with you. How many can lift a hand and say, Brother Ron, God is dealing with me in my heart about a spiritual issue. And it's kind of bugging me, but he's dealing with me. And I want you to pray for me. Is there one today who could lift? There's one hand. Anybody else today? Pray for me, Brother Ron. Pray for me. All right? God bless you. How many else could say, Brother Ron, you've been talking about this woman, and you've been talking about the man that was born blind. You were talking about Nicodemus. Brother Ron, I'm not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Would you pray for me today that I'd get saved? Just pray for me, Brother Ron. I'm not talking about church membership. I'm talking about being saved. How many could say, Brother Ron, here's my hand, and no one is looking. It's you and me in the fence post, because I want to pray for you. I won't mention your name. I won't mention who you are, where you are in the room, but I want to pray for you if you're not saved. How many could raise your hand and say, Brother Ron, pray for me. I'm not sure that if I died today, I'd go to heaven and pray for me. Brother Ron, is there one today who could slip up my hand and say, Brother Ron, pray for me today? Anybody? Just raise your hand and I'll remember you in prayer, in my prayer, and then we'll invite you to come forward at your, at your desire, if you want to, to be saved today. Just raise your hand up and we'll pray for anybody today. Pray for me, Brother Ron. Lord, today, we thank you for this woman that got saved. Thank you that you loved her, Father. And Jesus dealt with her so kindly and so directly, but kindly and graciously. And Father, today we know that you're dealing with us about spiritual needs in our lives. And Lord, one person raised a hand that said they had a spiritual need in their life and that you're dealing with it. Help them, Father, to say yes to thee. And Father, for others who needed to raise a hand for salvation and didn't do it. Others that needed to raise a hand for a spiritual problem if they have one and they didn't do that. Father, I pray that today that anyone like that would do spiritual business with you and seek your face and seek your will for their life. Father, I pray you would help our church to grow, that you would bless it. Help those who need to get baptized scripturally to have a desire to do that. Help those, Father, that need to join a good church like Glory Mountain Baptist Church. Help them, Father, to present themselves. And Father, I pray you bless our church. But most of all, Lord, we ask you bless this invitation time. For those that need to do spiritual business with you, praying and seeking your face in whatever issue of life, Lord, I pray that today would be the day for those who need to be saved to get saved, for those, Father, that need to make a decision spiritually for you, Lord, that that would be done today. I ask in Jesus' name and for his sake I pray.
Amen. As Peggy plays this invitation hymn today, let's all stand today. Let's all stand. If God has dealt with you today, I want to invite you to step out, take me by the hand and say, Brother Ron, I need to talk to you about this issue or that issue, whatever the need today. You just step out. And I, here's what I want to tell you. You take that first step and he'll help you the rest of the way. You take that first step and you'll be with you. Whatever your spiritual need is today,